What's up guys, it's Max here and I'm going to show you today how to win with the Scandinavian Defense. For our game today, I'm going to show you how a Grandmaster Sergei Azarov got crushed in the title Tuesday in Chess.com just this month by Devapa Yashaz. So it's a really wild game, so let's get into it. So it's Scandinavian D5, it's quite a popular opening at club level and in online chess. Because then we can kind of get to force a particular type of position on the board. And it's fairly easy to play, as we will see with this move of knight to f6. And here, black side to play, it's a very spicy fashion, where white played move d4. I will point out for those of you who are playing this line on online chess, you're very often going to face a move like knight to c3. But that's a move you're usually very happy to see, because what a lot of players will do is they will take on d5. And top of that, you get a very similar setup to what we see in the game with like knight c6. Knight f3, bishop g4, and this is something you can play in a lot of different versions. Say bishop to e3. Long castles, and we kind of see that this d4 pawn is just being attacked by all of these pieces. And it's a system I know that players like David Smerden and many other play strong players have used to just get very big advantage against with lower raid players out of the opening. So if you like the idea of getting like an early initiative with black, well this is one of the few openings that actually will give you a very good shot at doing so. There are other moves as well, but if white does play something like c4, Trying to hang on to that extra pawn. I find the move c6 to be quite a good reply. The point being that if you can take that pawn and put your knight on c6, you're generally doing pretty well. But if they do try to hang on to the pawn, well, you end up getting an improved Danish gambit here with e5. And you sort of see here that the bishop developed very actively. And one big difference compared to a Danish gambit is that in this version, well, the d3 pawn is now a weakness because black pl white played this move of c4. And so by attacking it down at d5, we're going to get very good play with black here. Well, white played to move d4 instead. And here is where we spice it up with a little gambit. Now, I do have to be honest and say this Portuguese gambit is not completely sound. But as an incredibly good score, I noticed that at the 1600 to 1800 level, that it's scoring something crazy like 55% for black. Whereas the normal score for black opening is like 46-47%. So black played to move bishop to g4 saying... Alright, I'm not just playing it as an anti-pre-move, but I'm also going to try and, you know, hit the queen and see what you're going to do about it, where black is increasing his lead in development. I think that the way that white should play in this case is probably the move pawn to f3. Uh, instead, if white plays a move like knight to f3, well, I find after queen takes d5, you are getting some nice pressure with the pin. Now, after bishop e2, do you remember the plan that black should go for in this position to try to attack the pawn on d4? Now, do remember also to... Uh, show your support, like the video to, well, show that you're enjoying it, that you're learning something new here. So after queen to d5 uh, and bishop e2, we now play the move knight to c6. And then if white castles, we cast along. We kind of see that black is getting quite a strong initiative by playing moves like e5, or even potentially taking that knight and taking on d4 in certain positions, depending on how it is that uh, the white plays it. I mean, I should say to be honest that white is probably still better after bishop e3. But okay, for the more advanced players, you can look up queen f5 and e4 of e4, which will give you some sharp play where if white's not precise, you can still get some good chances. In any case, the best move for think is the move of f3 though. And that's a move where after bishop f5, if white plays the move g4, I think this is the way you should play. I had a game of this actually just last year in the online Olympiad representing Australia, where I played this move for white, and it does give white a pretty big advantage. Fortunately, not very many players know this move, and those that do... Very few of them are aware that you should play the move knight to c3 and let them take on d5. Which is not something that's going to be obvious to the average player. But if white were to play the move c4 instead, which is a lot more common in this position, then it turns out the move e6 is quite nice. And I have a really fun trap I want to show you actually before I get into this game between Azarov and Yashaz. It's where if white were to play d6, well you might think, okay, we just take the pawn. And maybe some of you play a lot of online blitz, even like pre-moved, okay, I'm just going to pre-move fe6. Or bishop e6. But you know, hold that mouse for one moment. Instead the better way to play is knight to c6. And the reason for this is that we're not playing to catch up in material. We're playing straight for the king. Get all the pieces developed and make them in the middle. And the way we can do that is if white doesn't let's say cut his losses with bishop e3. But instead goes yum yums on f7. Well we go takes. And after bishop e3 and bishop b4. Funny enough the position is actually already winning for black. So after knight c3 rook e8. Usually white plays the move king to f2, trying to get out of the way of rook takes e3, but it turns out actually we can play it anyway. The time that happens in chess, the opponent plays the move idea that, okay, I stopped you playing your sacrifice or capturing the bishop. And then say, no you didn't, I just do it anyway. 
It's always kind of fun to prove the opponents wrong like that. But okay, what's the idea if I place king takes e3? Well, again, this is a moment where you might like to pause the video to try to come up with the fantastic trap the black has set and see how to actually win in this position. And also do make sure to subscribe as well to keep up to date with more of my chess content on this channel. So there's actually a lot of winning moves for black. So if you want to play a move like queen e7 or knight d4, it's actually also winning. But the really beautiful move is bishop to c2. And it turns out white just doesn't really have a good defense because if you play queen c2, there's queen takes d4, king e2, and after rook e8, there's just complete murder on the e-file. You know, after knight e4, knight takes e4. I remember the Australian international master Guy West actually had a game like this where he got in f e4 and rook e4 as black. And well, white can either run into king f3, queen e3, mate. He can give up the queen or he can resign. It more or less comes to the same thing. But if white doesn't take the bishop, let's say he tries to hang on to this pawn on d4 for dear life. Well, then the blow comes from another angle. Again, very well done if you found this beautiful tactic of knight to g4, which actually ends up just being completely winning here because... If you take the knight and, and if you don't, you're kind of just dead here. But if takes, you go queen to g5. And after king e2, rook e8, at some point that king is forced away from the defense of the queen. And then you know, we take the queen and win the game. There are actually even grandmasters who have fallen for this trap as white in many occasions. So you never know if you're some GM may fall for it if they don't show enough respect to the Portuguese. It's not that the Portuguese are objectively a good opening, but it scores very, very well for black. And it was David Smyrna who made me realize that this is quite a good practical weapon. Speaking of that, actually, if you do want to learn about, about Bishop G4, I also do have a course, Play the Strong Scandinavian, that does show you how to play these lines for black in more detail. So I'll just put that in the link in the description below for more info. For now, though, let's just enjoy this game and see how it plays out. Azarov played the safe-looking move, Bishop to E2. If he wants to play this, maybe he should throw in a Bishop to B5 check first, just to try to block the knight. Because now after Bishop takes and Knight takes e2, well now Queen d5 we see that Black has already got the Queen on a very active square. And where the Pawn on g2 is under fire. And after cards, I think you guys know by now the step that we play when you have this structure with the d5 Pawn being captured. We play the move Knight to c6, hitting the Pawn in this way. And after move Knight bc3 we see once again that the Queen is actually very flexible on this f5 square. Although I do think, to be fair, that Queen H5 would actually have been a better move in order to pin the knight. Because one point to keep in mind is that because you do have a bit less space in this position, you're actually quite happy with the exchange of queens in general. Because in this case, after takes, takes, and let's say E6 or even castles long. But what you notice is that the more the pieces get traded, the easier it is to find good squares for the remaining pieces here as black. And when moves like D5 and Knight B4 coming, we can sort of make an argument that that D-pawn could even be a bit of a weakness for white, even in the endgame. So it's a pretty safe position, like in general the end games are pretty decent for black in the Scandinavian. Instead though, black played queen f5 and I do think that if white had played the move d5 that that would have been quite annoying hitting the knight and it would have given white definitely some initiative. But if white doesn't find this move then his position starts to get a bit difficult as we'll see. Uh, white played the move knight to g3 and after queen to g6, knight b5 we can already kind of see that white is going on a bit of a wild goose chase on the queen side. And now after the move castles we see that white should really have put that knight on e2 to defend this pawn. Because now white has this dilemma that either he's going to like, after a6, where either he's going to lose the pawn on d4, or he's going to lose the knight. And neither is really a great option. I mean, if white does try and move like c3, trying to defend that pawn, well, we boot that knight back, and after knight f3, e5, you can sort of see just how powerful it is when you have that rook facing opposite their queen, and that pawn e5 hitting d4. Black has everything you could possibly dream of and more. And with some idea like even h5, h4, and just using that knight as a hook for the attack on the king, I don't honestly see white surviving here. Instead, white played the move c4, and after the move e6, I think that the move a6 would have actually been stronger, because you want to kick the knight away in order to pick up that pawn on d4. I mean, white can try fishing pole moves like a4, and hope to get some sort of, you know, soupy style attack with a b5, a b5. But if you just ignore it and play like d5 or e5 or h5, like, I don't really see this being playable for white. I mean, you guys ignore the knight, it doesn't really do much on b5, you know. Well, black played the move e6 instead. Okay, this was a blitz game, so I guess we should be a little bit understanding that the players didn't play perfectly. White played the move queen a4, which I do think was a big mistake. Like, at this point, you have to take your chances, and at least with bishop f4, you could sort of hit the pawn and start fighting for the initiative. You know, now you can meet a6 with knight c7, so things are not as clear as they were before. Well, instead, white played queen to a4, 
black went for a6 and well it's just all bad news for white after i mean playing knight c3 and knight d4 would just leave white down a pawn and give black a very strong initiative to boot again ideas like even queen c2 and just getting those queens off is one way to neutralize any possible attack on our king uh, it's one point you know that in general training pieces is usually a pretty decent idea when you're up material because it makes your material bank on average more valuable after bishop to f4 Black played a bit of a curious move at 98, but it's actually not such a bad move to make sure that pawn stays defended. And here White kind of went for d5, so I'm playing very desperately. In retrospect, he probably should just play a bit more solely, like maybe rook c1, and just try to get the final pieces into play. Uh, because, I mean, that's one thing that Grandmasters generally do. Okay, sure, this Grandmaster didn't play as White, but most of the time, Grandmasters in long games, you'll see them make sure all of the pieces are in the party. You know, make sure none of the friends are left behind or left out. Well, after d5, Black took... And then after CD5, I mean, technically it is safe to play A takes B5 that Black doesn't really get, White doesn't really get a real attack there. But the move Rook D5 is still pretty good by White, by Black. And after Knight C3, which is a mistake, then Rook D4 and, well, suddenly we see that we have the fork on the Queen and on the Bishop and it's lights out for White. The game ended with Queen B3, Rook takes F4, Rook F E1, Knight F6, and now we see Black doing a good job of making sure that all of his pieces are in the game. You know, the Rook, the Knight, and the Bishop. Knight D1 was played, and after Rook B4, Queen C3. Again, Rook E8, a very sensible move just to trade off the pieces. Like, when you're up a, a Knight and a Pawn, like, a Bishop and a Pawn like this, well, it definitely means that by trading the pieces, it makes it much easier to win than if you give them hopes to keep the pieces on and attack your King somehow. So after Knight E3, Black played Rook B5, you know, showing some real creativity with the Rook lifts. White played a3 to stop bishop b4, but then bishop b5, the danger comes from another angle. And after queen c4, bishop takes b2, rook c2, bishop d4, rook d1, and now rook to c5. Well, White finally decided to give up the ghost and realized that it was time to resign. So there you are, in just 25 moves, this Indian youngster, uh, Devapa Yashas, managed to crush a the Belarusian GM, uh, Sergei Azarov. Actually, I remember as I was a player who's also had good results against me in the past in Blitz. So, you know, I totally wish I had known he was weak against this line back when I was playing online Blitz. But anyway, you guys now have the opportunity to use this weapon to beat your difficult opponents. Whether they're players like just say 1600 on lead chess. Or maybe some GM in a symbol where you can try to take him out with some of these traps if they don't know what they're doing. In any case, good luck with playing the Scandinavian in your own games. Just a reminder of the lines that we looked at. Well, basically, we saw it, we were playing D5. And not taking the pawn back on d5 immediately, but instead going knight f6. And then putting up a on g4 to get a lead in development and basically develop the piece aggressively. And it's true, this line is one that if white plays all the best moves, black is in trouble. But in big spike experience, most players, especially at the lower levels, are not really prepared for the system. And you've got to get a very good active game with that queen d5, knight c6 and that sort of thing that we saw in, uh, you know, in the various variations, including in the main game. So yeah, good luck with this opening and I'll see you in the next video for how to beat that next chess opening.